Hello everybody, I'm Eternal Flame here, and welcome to part 2 of What If Megumi Took You to Spot and Cursed Sumiki to Become a Cursed Spirit. Where in the last part, Megumi had fought against 3 Grade 1 Curses as well as 1 Special Grade Curse, and while he was able to defeat one of the Grade 1 Curses, he was not able to defeat the other two as well as the Special Grade. However, thanks to Sumiki interfering right before he could summon Maharaga, they did end up defeating the Curses, and later on he had a conversation with Ghetto who was trying to recruit him to his cause of wiping out every non-sorcerer on the planet. However, not just did Megami refuse that offer, he ended up putting the thought of what could potentially go wrong with his plan into Ghetto's head. And while Ghetto did declare a night parade of a hundred demons and escape, now he is left with the thought of what Megami said to him and questioning his own plan. As we now return back to Ghetto, who is currently returned back to his home base in order to think things over and prepare for his eventual attack, but more importantly, he is also returned in order to fully contemplate if he wants to go over and through his plan again or not. After all, Megami had brought up several valid points. Even if Ghetto did succeed in wiping out every cursed spirit that would arise as a result of the fear that would come from wiping out humanity, even if they did succeed in that, they would have to start over from scratch, and the world would effectively be reset back to the Iron Age. After all, while Ghetto and the other sorcerers were smart, it would take way too long to learn how to rebuild everything. They didn't know how to rebuild all of that, and they would have to find their own way to do so, or they would have to hope that they can rebuild everything from scratch. After all, there was only so much their curse techniques and curse energy could do. It made it even worse that there was no way they were going to get Gojo on their side either, who could help with this, or other sorcerers who might have curse techniques that fit with this. Sure, it would help to permanently remove curses from the world, but was the risk really worth it? as he had a flashback back to when Yuki and him talked so long ago after the defeat of Toji, remembering back to this entire conversation that spawned this idea in his head to wipe out all of humanity. As he had to question if this was the reason why Yuki didn't go down that path, sure, it would be an immediate fix, but there would be way too many bad consequences and they would have to reset the world from scratch. Yuki was trying to find a way to do it without needing to reset the world, and it all became clear to him. He had let his rage, his hatred towards humanity for what they did to Rika Amanai, blind him completely. He wanted to wipe out all non-sorcerers on the planet purely because of what had happened so long ago, all the times that he had seen non-sorcerers treat sorcerers badly, whether it was Mimiko and Naniko, whether it was members of his own family, whether it was Rika Amanai, just for the fact that they were sorcerers. Ghetto had an immense desire to protect the weak, but the person that he saw currently as the weak were the sorcerers, because the sorcerers were willingly allowing themselves to be overthrown by humanity, even though humanity was weaker than them, they were allowing it. Which resulted in weaker sorcerers who didn't have the means to fight back yet to suffer, because the stronger sorcerers were not allowing it, but he was realizing just wiping all of them out was not the key to protecting them either. Now Ghetto still hated all of non-sorcerers, nothing about that was ever going to change, in fact he hated them even more for this, mainly because of the fact that he realized wiping them out would not be the thing that could solve his issues. He hated this, he wanted to find an easy path, but there was no easy path, he just knew he needed to find a way in order to protect the weak. However, then a solution came to his mind, a pretty easy one as well, which was instead of wiping out all of the non-sorcerers, what if he just made sorcerers the one in charge of the planet, and then slowly with time eventually root out all of the non-sorcerers, rather than doing one massive wipeout of all non-sorcerers, instead he just slowly with time made the world sorcerers instead of non-sorcerers. That would be the best option that they could have, allowing them to keep the world as it is right now and improve it more and more for the cursed energy, while slowly getting rid of the problem that was cursed spirits. However, even trying that was going to be difficult and way, way too time consuming. There was no way he was going to pull that in just his normal lifespan, so he'd need to find some way to extend his life, which he knew was possible. After all, Ryomen Sukuna had found the way to do so. He figured out some way to split his soul into several fingers, so if Sukuna could do it, then so could he. Of course, Tengen was also immortal, but he considered that basically impossible to mimic, mainly because that was Tengen's own curse technique that allowed them to do so as he told the other members of his family that they were going to call off the Night Parade of 100 Demons. Now, at first they were a little bit sad about this and they did want to go through with it, until Ghetto properly explained to them that even if they won here, even if everything went right for them, it would not lead to the world that they want, and it would be too much work and too much risk to try and repair it, which made them slowly understand, especially because most of them were just following Ghetto's will anyway. However, it was then someone else entered into the fray, another sorcerer. A woman with short black hair as well as black eyes, but most notably of all, they had a large scar across their forehead, one that looked like stitches. Now, first the members of the family were on guard, including Ghetto, however, the woman very quickly explained that she wasn't actually here against them, but because she wanted to join them. She was a sorcerer just like them, and she despised all the non-sorcerers that existed. 
So after doing some searching, she found this place and she knew she wanted to join with them. She knew that this would be the way to accomplish her goals. She already did have a plan set in motion, but it was something that she was going to need the help of strong sorcerers like Ghetto from. And Gendo was more than willing to accept the help, after all, they were another sorcerer, he saw no reason why not to trust them, and he did ask for the woman's name, as the woman told them that her name was Kaori Itadori. As Gojo and tens of other sorcerers were now waiting, waiting for Ghetto to begin his attack while Megami and Maki were staying behind at Jujutsu High, however, nothing came. They waited for hours and yet nothing came, no cursed spirits, and at first Gojo thought that this was just all a trap, and that Ghetto had mainly gone to Jujutsu High, however there were no reports there either, and this was really weird. That was until a single flyhead came over, and the flyhead was carrying a phone in order to play a message for Gojo, which the message was that he was going to call off the Night Parade of 100 Demons, he can thank Megami for convincing him that this wasn't the right path. However, while he did agree that this wasn't the right path anymore, this didn't mean that he was going to join forces with Jujutsu High either, just that he wasn't planning to go on his quest to wipe out every non-sorcerer on the planet. And from that, Gojo was feeling a wide range of emotions right now. In one way, he was really happy, because this would mean he would not need to kill his best friend. However, he was also rather cautiously optimistic. After all, Ghetto wasn't really planning to join sides with them, and there was no telling what he was actually planning to do either. Furthermore, he still also had his several thousands of curses as well, and for all he knew, Ghetto could just be doing this as a bluff and a feint in order to prepare for a proper war and maybe upgrading their curse amount from a couple thousand to several millions, since he did know there were many curses on the planet. So as a result of that, Gojo, as well as several of the students and sorcerers, now felt a much greater desire to get stronger in preparation for Ghetto. After all, beforehand, it was just getting stronger for curses and having to fight future curses, but now, it was preparation for whatever Ghetto might have planned, especially because a bunch of the curses didn't actually trust in Gojo to take out Ghetto if he became a threat. The reason for that was because Gojo knew about the fact that Ghetto wiped out a village of people, and yet he still didn't go for him in the 10 years that had passed. So they knew that Gojo wouldn't be reliable to take on this threat. Any cursed spirit they knew Gojo would definitely be reliable on, but not Ghetto. So they knew they were going to need to get stronger. After all, most sorcerers had non-sorcerers that they knew they wanted to protect. And this leads into quite a lot of good things actually happening for the timeline. Now there are a lot more sorcerers that are actually left alive, mainly because the Night Parade never happened, which did butcher quite a few of them. A good chunk of them also felt a massive desire to get stronger and train as well, in preparation for the special grade threat that was Suguru Ghetto. This also results in Kyoto High as well as Tokyo High having a bunch more students than what they would have in canon, because a few of them did not die from the Night Parade. Nanami would more than likely get his Black Flash record from another mission, and this also leads into him not retiring from being a Jujutsu Sorcerer either, mainly because the Night Parade never happens, and he never has to watch the students die from the Night Parade. And now all the students are also going to start out at a bit of a stronger position than what they were in canon. Even Maki is going to get stronger, mainly because Mai is going to be afraid of what Ghetto might end up doing and want to get stronger as a result. Now Mai is not going to feel an immense desire to train, but it's going to be enough to allow Maki to at least be somewhat stronger than her canon counterpart. However, the most important person here to focus on is going to be Megami, the title character of the What If that I realize I haven't talked about that much yet. Megami himself did not take this as a victory for one very, very important reason, and that was the fact that Ghetto hadn't actually attacked. Ghetto hadn't admitted he was wrong, just that he wasn't going to go down this path. Ghetto was still a threat, and he still had a hate for non-sorcerers. Megami only pointed out the flaws in his plan. He never really changed his opinion on it, just that his plan was stupid. That was all he had done. Ghetto was still a threat, and Megami knew that he was going to be the one to put him down at the end of the day. If Ghetto ended up trying to do anything wrong, he was going to kill him. But he still had something else he needed to do as well, which was helping free Sumiki from the curse that he had placed on her. Now, Gojo was actually hoping that Ghetto might end up arriving and battling against Megami, which might end up helping freeing the curse. However, that did not end up happening, so they were going to have to do this the long way in order to figure out how to do so. However, he did explain something else to Megami that he found rather interesting, which was the fact that Megami was actually the one to curse Sumiki and not the other way around, and that love was the reason why the Sumiki was still around, because he had loved Sumiki so much that he couldn't accept her dying, but most importantly of all, that Gojo and Megami were related, that Megami was a very distant cousin of him and a member of the Gojo clan. This was because of Megami's mom having very distant relations to the Gojo clan as well. However, he did tell Megami to keep this as a secret between the two of them. After all, if the Zenin clan or Gojo clan found out about this, both of them would be fighting even more for Megami than they already were, and they knew that Megami would not want to deal with that. 
as Megumi had now gained a new goal, a new focus and determination in order to do a total of three things. Number one, free Sumiki from the curse. The second thing was to tame Maharaga. And the third and most important thing of all was to prepare to protect so many normal people from the likes of Ghetto and other threats that might come in the future. So this forced Megumi to begin to be even more experimental with his curse technique. After all, he knew he wasn't prepared to take on Maharaga, not yet. So he wanted to figure out new ways to use his curse technique and become a better sorcerer with what he already had access to. This led into Megumi making the discovery that he was able to hold people as well as things in his own shadow, as well as be able to go into other people's shadows, and this was going to be very useful for fighting against other sorcerers especially, mainly because most people wouldn't be prepared to be dragged into their own shadow and be suffocated in there. He also had a very large focus on trying to free Sumiki from the curse. Of course he was trying to get stronger over this time, but his main focus was freeing Sumiki from the curse. However, even as a year passed, he ultimately ended up failing. However, something else did happen as well, as Megumi had decided to ask Gojo if he could be bumped down to a first year at the time he was actually supposed to enter Jujutsu High. While he was thankful for being allowed in early, he did want to actually go through school like a normal kid and go through it with people his own age, not people older than him by a year. There was still that desire Megumi had to have somewhat of a normal life. And during this year of training, he did come up with a theory that he was trying to figure out how he would do, but he wasn't too sure yet. He wanted to see if he could pour Sumiki's curse energy into his 10 shadows. After all, pouring them into the Shikigami would be a much easier method to get rid of Sumiki's curse. After all, he would be able to regulate the curse energy a lot easier in the 10 shadows than he would be in a sword, which was breakable. But between missions, training, figuring out how to use 10 shadows better, research, as well as learning how to use Sumiki in combat properly, he couldn't fully fulfill this theory yet. And one year eventually passes, one rather uneventful year in between killing curses and all the sorcerers getting stronger until Maki Zenin is sent out on a mission to retrieve one of Sakuna's figures that they had reported to be found. Now in case you're wondering why Maki is being sent out instead of Megumi, Megumi is a bit too powerful to be sent out for missions like this, however Maki is certainly fitting the build to be strong enough for a mission like this considering the curse that they're reporting isn't too strong. That and the Hyrups really did not want to risk the potential of Sumiki interacting with a Sakuna Curse Finger, considering what those were able to do for normal Curse Spirits, let alone someone like Sumiki who was a powerful Vengeful Curse Spirit. This later on leads into them both battling against the Curse Spirit that they battled against before, as well as Yuji consuming the Curse Finger of Sakuna and reawakening Sakuna in the modern era. This also leads into Gojo battling against Sukuna in Yuji's body, after all he did still want to test them nonetheless, and show off in front of Maki instead of showing off in front of Megumi. Yuji was also able to tell pretty fast that Maki did not like her teacher. As Megumi heard about this news, and he was contemplating how he felt about this. Now of course he was more than aware of the threat that was Sukuna. Sukuna was someone who could kill a mass amount of people, but at the same time he couldn't help but feel a bit of a kinship with Yuji as well, even though we hadn't met him. Several people had thought of Megumi as a threat purely because of the existence of Sumiki. Sure, with time, Megumi had been able to learn how to control Sumiki and not release them on bad targets, but that wasn't always the case. Now, Sumiki did always have a bit more of a dormant personality, so she was never really going to be a threat to most people, but at the same time, Megumi couldn't always summon her and call upon her. But now, Sumiki was more than willing to work alongside him and more than willing to help him as well. So part of him had to wonder, could the same happen with Sukuna? Of course, there was no way it was going to be willing, but he had to believe there was some potential way that that curse could be turned for good, just like Sumiki's was. But ultimately, he decided that he would decide his opinion when he finally met Yuji in person. Was he going to be on the side that he should die right here and now, or was he going to believe that he should be spared? Now, Megami was not the only first year. There still were three other first years left available, but they were currently all out on a mission, so Gojo was going to have to wait for them to meet Yuji as well. But Gojo was more than willing to introduce Megami to Yuji, and it didn't take long until the two of them met. And once the two of them met, he couldn't help but notice the fact that Yuji was a lot like somebody else he used to know in his past. Yuji was a lot like Sumiki. He was a good person, someone who he definitely would have been okay with Sumiki dating, as he wished that Sumiki was not a cursed spirit and actually a sorcerer, so he could try and set that up, but at the same time that wasn't going to happen ever. But he also was just happy to see who Yuji was as a person, that he was a good person intent on killing Sakuna and helping as many people as he could, especially when he heard that his goal was to give people good deaths. And because of that, he actually explained to Yuji what his own goal was. There were several more vengeful cursed spirits that existed around the world. Not all of them were like Sumiki who were willing to help people. However, he wanted to help free as many of them as he could. That was his goal, to make sure vengeful cursed spirits wouldn't exist anymore. And he wanted to ask Yuji to help him with this goal. 
This would allow human spirits that were turned into cursed spirits to finally be able to move on in peace, and upon hearing that goal, Yuji was more than willing to immediately agree in order to help them out, as the two of them now had very similar goals to each other. Yuji wanted to help Megumi out with his own goal, while trying to get as many fingers of Sukuna as possible to eventually die and take the King of Curses down with him. Now, Megumi did not like the fact that Yuji's eventual goal was to die, and a part of him did wonder if he could eventually find one of the Sukuna fingers without him knowing and hiding it, but that was going to be for later. However, there was one other thing that Yuji desired upon seeing how strong Megumi was, which was strength. Strength to be just like Megumi. After all, Megumi himself was insanely strong, already a special grade upon his first year of entering, and he was the same age as him as well. Meanwhile, there was Yuji who was still much more newer to Curse Energy, and he asked Megumi another question. He asked Megumi if he could help teach him how to utilize Curse Energy properly. Megumi nodded as he was more than prepared to help him with that, and he told him that the two of them were going to start today. Unfortunately, that was when Gojo interrupted, telling the two of them that they weren't going to have time as they had to pick up a new student. Yuji wasn't going to be the only student that was going to join them today, as they had one more person to add to their first year generation, making this one of the biggest first year generation ever. Yuji looked a bit impressed by that until he looked over at Megumi, who Megumi told him that there were only going to be six of them, including this new person. Which that really put into perspective for Yuji just how little Jujutsu sorcerers actually do end up surviving. As Yuji, Gojo, and Megumi were all on their way to meet Nobara, while at the same time Kenjaku was preparing with his new ally Ghetto for what was to come in the future. And that is where we're going to end off this part of what if Megumi turns Sumiki into a cursed spirit. I'm curious to see what you guys think in the comment section down below of this episode. We're going to go down a much more custom story than we are normally, so I'm really excited for this, but I'm going to see y'all later. Have a good day. Peace out. Now up next, I do want to spend some time talking about the sponsor to the channel, Fan Dominion, an old friend of the channel that has a ton of cool anime merch, especially on the JJK side of things, but cool merch overall. And if you're looking for something that looks stylish, something that you can wear out in public and not be called a weeb for, but at the same time be recognized by your friends for wearing something really cool, they have good things in store for you. Or are you looking for something to complete your cosplay with? Well, Fan Dominion has you covered, and don't worry, they aren't expensive at all. And on top of that, if you use my code both in the description as well as on screen now, you can get a 10% discount. Yep, that's right, a 10% discount. However, now I'm going to spend some time showing off their beautiful catalog. And if you like any of this merch and any of this merch looks awesome to you, remember our code EF10 and you'll be able to get a 10% discount. Anyways, I'm going to see y'all later.